I wonder if you have perhaps noticed fewer flying insects around. If you have, maybe you're pleased, but we need them desperately, at least our planet does. So what's being done to avoid what's being called an insect Armageddon? You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Global warming pesticides, us, all of us, we're having a dramatic effect on some of the tiniest, tiniest things on our planet. Scientists are warning that if insect numbers keep on going down, there will be serious complications for all life on Earth. It's been dubbed an ecological Armageddon, with the prospects of flying insects dying out. They're vital to ecosystems, but under current climate projections, they're set to lose half their natural habitats. So what impact would it have on humanity? Bees and butterflies help pollinate a third of our food, from tomatoes and pears to almonds and cashew nuts. But in the past 25 years, the number of flying insects has dropped by 75%, with pesticides, climate change and the loss of natural habitats all playing a pivotal role. In America, beekeepers have reported 40% of their hives dying unexpectedly in the past year. That's up from 33% a year earlier. While the Paris Agreement aims to bring countries together to combat climate change and adapt to its effects, research shows that even with all the carbon cuts already promised, global warming would still halve insects' habitats by the end of the century, with pollinators like bees particularly affected. Albert Einstein used to say that three years after the bees will disappear, the population, the human population will be disappearing as well. With the increasing urbanisation of greenlands and the rapid growth of the human population, the effects on biodiversity are far-reaching. À l'échelle d'une génération, 30 ans, 35 ans, on voit des espèces végétales qui sont en train de disparaître autour de nous. Cela signifie que l'impact de la montée des températures sur la terre nous atteint et que nous devons forcément réagir. So is this declining trend reversible? Some countries are already trying to battle the plummeting number of insects by calling for the ban of pesticides, embracing eco-friendly lifestyles and introducing regeneration programmes. The butterflies are not increased, they are decreased. So these are, we, set, uh, so we set up these for protecting some of the endangered species or conservation, some of the butterflies. There are also recommendations for people to grow their own herbs, wildflowers and fruit trees, as well as buying organic products in order to help bees thrive again. With a gradual decline in insects effectively killing off our food sources, is the issue being taken seriously enough? Will the Paris Agreement actually do enough to tackle the global epidemic? Or are we waiting for the inevitable to happen before humanity seriously considers the impacts? I'm very pleased to say that we have joining us from Armidale, that's in Australia, Manu Saunders, an ecologist at the University of New England. With me at the table, Simon Leather, Professor of Entomology, that is, the study of insects, at Harper Adams University. We have Nick Rao, who's bee campaigner from Friends of the Earth, and Lutvi Radwan, who runs an organic farm. Thanks ever so much for, for coming in. This is obviously a serious problem. Simon, let me, let me come to you first of all. Do you believe it really is happening? Uh, well, I think there's definitely... I get the impression there's definitely fewer insects. There's a lot of evidence, I think, that uh, insects are not as abundant as I remember them as a child and as a student, for example. Or indeed as a postman, as a postman which, which yeah. once were. So, yeah, when I was sort of paying my way through university, I used to be a, a postman in a small village in North Yorkshire, and one of the sort of things that I, as a an aspiring entomologist then uh, liked was the fact that I could find lots of tiger moths plastered against people's patio doors that had been uh, sort of attracted by the light that people had left on and you know they were really really common and now they're you hardly ever see a garden tiger and woolly bears which we used to play with as kids you know that's an insect that's not, a, the, not a woolly bear no a woolly yeah, bear yeah, is, yeah. The, is the is the caterpillar which is okay. uh, you, we used to play have great fun with in, yeah. people talk about the windscreen test as well don't they which is when i was a kid i remember going 
my father used to have to clean the windscreen two or three times on, on a longish journey. Uh, Mandy, let me come to you on this one. Nowadays, we're not seeing so many insects on number plates or on windscreens. Uh, is, is that one way of gauging it? I've, it is. It's a way that uh, has been actually used in scientific studies to <laughs> drive around with a car with um, sticky traps stuck on the side, and they have um, shown that there there are less insects are being stuck to cars now than there was once. Um, I think it. It. I, I think the younger generation, and I'm speaking for myself here because I don't. You know, I've only been paying attention, I guess, to insects for the last 15, 20 years. Whereas, and I don't really think that I notice a difference, whereas my mother um, is constantly saying that she's noticing recently the garden that she's worked in for the last 50 odd years. Um, she keeps ringing me up and saying, oh, I don't see any bees anymore. I don't see any butterflies anymore. Uh, so I, I think it um, is something that you have to have been paying attention to the same system for a long period of time. <clears throat> Let's bring it back to, to the studio here now, and either of you can jump in on this one, or both of you. What's uh, going to be the result if we see the insect population going down and down and down? Well, um, I, guess, I, I, I guess the first thing you think about is, is perhaps the, if the simple economics, uh, we depend on insects for ecosystem services. I think bees are the most obvious example. They <coughs> pollinate our food. 75% of food crops around the world depend on some sort of animal pollinator and particularly bees. Uh, bees contribute, what, 650 million to the UK economy in, in terms of pollination services for things like sort of apples and pears or whatever, or you'll see rape. They all depend on bees. Uh, other things, you know, we, we, uh, insects are, are natural pest control mechanisms. We've got ladybirds and hoverflies in a garden that eat aphids. They'll also do the same for farmers, so they're, they're performing a you know, very valuable function mm. in the fields. Uh, we could even talk about humble dung beetles, which are which are which are cleaning up the the, the manure from the cattle, uh, you know, all around the country. And and, and again, they're, they're making an enormous contribution, uh, an unseen contribution, which we really need to recognise. I've been given this quote uh, from a biologist called Edward Wilson. O. Wilson. It said, "If we were to disappear, mankind, the world would re regenerate itself. Um, if insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse in, into chaos. It would be the end Ooh, yeah. of life on Earth, effectively. Yep, pretty wouldn't much. It? Well." for our sort of life, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, uh, and everybody else's life as well, I think. Um, we'd be sort of down to the microbial level, uh, so if, if we lost insects. So. We, don't, I mean, we don't think about these things, obviously, yeah. because they're so small and, and, yeah. and out of the way. Yeah. But I mean, just recently we had a, um, a dung beetle specialist came mm -hmm. to our farm. She was interested in looking at the poo, seeing if there was a difference in activity in, on an organic farm, yeah. and she, she basically uh, identified the numbers and the, the various types on our farm and found a couple which are actually quite rare. Um, so we can change this, we can turn this around. Small changes in the practices of farming and you can actually see well, I was regeneration and creation of habitats. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you think, because yeah. you're an organic farmer, if you really believe that pesticides are to blame for this. Oh, I, th I think we should move on from the debate of, of whether there's a decline yeah. and what's to blame. I think, you know, pesticides, land clearance, um, urban sprawl, removal of hedgerows for farming, oh, yeah. all of those things are obvious candidates and I think collectively we can apportion blame there. Let me go back to, to, to Manu. Um, I was wondering and if in fact with fewer insects in the world we're seeing less pollination, or whether those that are left are actually working much, much harder and we haven't seen a decline in uh, pollination so, in general, po uh, pollination is a is a difficult one because um, the commercial pollination services that are provided by mostly uh, the honeybees, European honeybees, but also in some places bumblebees as well, buffer tends to buffer um, what is going on naturally in that system. So, because a lot of crops have relied for many years on renting honeybee hives or or bumblebees, um, it's, it maybe isn't as obvious in those systems if natural insects were declining. Um, so the thing with uh, crop pollination is that bees aren't the only pollinator and they're not actually the best pollinator for a lot of crops. Um, plus the evidence that we have for what crops need to be pollinated by who uh, is very limited to a small number of important crops that we've kind of paid the most attention to in the past. And there's actually quite a lot of crops in the world that we still don't know who is the best pollinator and, and you know, how we need to manage those habitats for them.
Is that the sort of thing you're studying, look, for your, on the farm? Uh, well, How it best works and what <coughs> insects best to get in? It's the sort of farming that we do, that yes, I mean, we, we, we believe a, a more mixed type of farming where you're, you're producing a lot of different crops, but also you're maintaining areas where there are natural wildflowers, a, a wide diversity of plants, obviously uh, leads to habitats and, and that symbiotic relationship with the insects that you need or that actually benefit from those habitats you're mm. creating. So is, is this something mm. new or uh, have been going on for a long time, we just haven't noticed it? What, the, the decline? The decline. Um, well, I think it's... Uh, well, yeah, it's, it's, there's lots of contradictory evidence. That's, or we haven't got the studies, really. So from the, the, the best studies are from Rothamsted, who be uh, that's the research station based in, in Harpenden. And they've been running light traps and suction, insect suction traps for 50 years. And their data have been really useful for showing declines in the things that they catch in flying insects. And those, in the main, apart from, say, the pest insects, have shown declines in in moth numbers, for example. Uh, but again, it's slightly complicated that some moths uh, are, aren't declining, but that's where the habitat's been increased. So if you look at uh, moths that feed on tree species, they haven't declined, especially in the north. And that's because there's been increases in forestry and tree planting over the last 50 years. Whereas in the south, there's been intensification of agriculture which has reduced the habitats and I think so I think a lot of it it's not just pesticides it is habitats as well uh, but um, but these are flying insects why don't they fly somewhere where they're gonna find better stuff well <laughs> they don't have that much <coughs> cho choice I guess uh, you tend to be restricted for your oviposition your egg laying sites and things like that so and a lot of the the moths and the butterflies have very specific uh, habitat requirements and also some of them, you might say, are a bit... They need corridors to get them, so you can yeah. have a suitable habitat, but if there's no way for them to get there, then... You know, you, you've been banging on about this for a long time, but it's only yeah. recently made, made the headlines, mm. and I think in yeah. part, perhaps, because everybody... Well, not everybody, but most people love the idea of bees flying <laughs> around make, making honey, and we've been talking about the fact that the bee populations are on the way down. Is, is, there, is it all part of the same thing, or is there a particular well, well, problem well, I think for bees? It is. I mean, um, we um, perhaps cannily took the took the took the uh, decision to focus on on bees because they're, they're great indicator species and people love them and recognise their value. So you know we launched our bee cause campaign back in 2012. Um, but it's you know the, the the issues that affect bees you know affect affect insects. We, in the UK, what we've got 260 species of bees uh, over the past century. We've lost perhaps 13, and the other species. Most of them are, are declining in, in their abundance and their distribution. We've got a few new bees coming in, in, into the country, Where of course. Um, they, well, they'll, they'll come across the channel. Um, you see, so they can fly to where they, they need to be. They, they can. I mean, obviously, some, some, some species can respond reasonably well and benefit from climate change, but the majority can't. And that's why, as Simon says, you need interconnected habitats uh, in order for them to migrate and, and respond. And those integrated habitats don't exist uh, uh, largely because of this, this intensified agriculture. And we, we are turning our... We are turning our, our countryside into sort of a bit of an industrial machine, and and that is that is very apparent in the in the north south divide where we've got highly intensive mm. and um, low biodiversity in 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 the south and the southeast, and relatively relatively successful you know uh, I'm, I'm, scenarios I'm in the come north. Back to yeah. Yeah. In just a yeah. second. Well, well, I, it was just a point okay, on that yeah, that yeah. I think you know with um, particularly the pollinators, bees and other pollinators, pesticide use tends to um, concentrate in the highest. Uh, accumulations in the pollen and the nectar mm -hmm. so we do find that they're probably you know inordinately affected by the use of pesticides. I'm going to ask you in a minute if, if the, the, the bee campaign is working but uh, Manu I heard I heard the noise from Australia I guess you <laughs> wanted to say something. Oh no I was just a I was a nodding in agreement but um, yeah it's I guess from Australia, there's been uh, le we actually know a lot less here than than you guys do, and I think it's because there's been a, a shorter history here of paying attention to insects. Um, you know, the UK has a very long, going back centuries, history of natural history societies that are keeping note of what's going on in their um, surroundings, which obviously hasn't happened as much here. Let, let me ask this question from a lay, layman's point of view. We're, we're talking specifically about flying insects, mm -hmm. but I know you started off loving ants more than you did those with wings. Yeah. Um, is it the same for all insects? 
what that the decline the, the problem. decline well I, you know the creepy crawlies the dung beetles we were talking about yeah, the ants well i think again it depends so things like pest aphids of course don't seem to have declined <laughs> because we are providing habitats for them so but um the those th other things i guess which people used to maybe consider pests things that live feed on grass roots for example so saint mark's flies which I, I don't know if you remember those they're the sort of big bumbly black things that sort of appear about a month ago and when i was a kid you could sort of, they used to sort of swarm and those were the things that used to leave the the red the red blood on your windscreen as their <laughs> their eyes impacted uh, and you can hardly s i mean yes they're still there but they're not in the sort of you used to be able to grab handfuls of them out of the air but what about those on the ground ants etc cetera, etc cetera. Well, anybody got a thought on that i mean there are so many millions and millions and millions and millions billions uh, of them. Well, again, uh, I, I would come back to the, the sort of habitats mm. we're creating. Yeah. When, you, when you look at mm. the soil, the soil is a living structure itself and it contains so many organisms. Um, you look at the soil structure on intensified farming fields, there, there really is no structure, there is no depth to that soil, there's no body, there's there, there, therefore there's very little for insects and other animals to actually, you know, yeah. to live in that area and survive. So, and when you're removing the hedgerows and increasing the size of the fields, you, you're clearly reducing it. So what you do on your farm organically is, is, is you treat it in such a way that you hope to encourage these insects to come back. But how do you know they're going to be the, the right ones? <laughs> I, I think, in a way, you have to... Um, possibly not think about right or wrong in that sense. You create a space for nature um, and you have to farm with nature. You have to stop having this attitude that you're um, an economic activity, a purely economic activity where you're extracting just the, what you want, the monoculture, etc., of whatever crop or whatever you're going for. Um, and, and we try and leave, as you mentioned, yeah. corridors for animals to migrate through our farm. Not always the best. We allow the fox to come through amongst the chickens. <laughs> um, we leave. How many chickens you got left? <laughs> <laughs> you protect them in your own ways, but you know you, you try your best. But you have to apportion a certain part of what you're doing to nature. So it swings um, and roundabouts. Yeah, it? absolutely. You, I mean, you we, might attract some insects that you don't necessarily want, but at the same time you are getting some. You of reduce you your do. economic productivity. For example, you know, we do a bit of woodland management. Occasionally we'll leave a fallen tree to just rot away where it is. We won't remove that tree. We'll allow it to stay there. Some stacks of willow, we'll leave them. Well, them I'm going to ask away. you later on whether in fact um, you think more people are going to turn to organic farming, uh, mm. for whether it could be economical. Mm. But let's go back yeah, sure. to, to Nick here and ask about the bee campaign. Um, has it worked? I think uh, certainly there's been a huge public resonance. People love bees. Um, we've, uh, we've had a great response. People are going out in their gardens, creating bee-friendly gardens. Councils are taking action to create bee-friendly habitats. They're not cutting the wildlife verges. They're letting the grass grow in parks. Um, we, uh, nationally, we've managed to get a, a, a national action plan so that you know the government is now uh, turning their attention to this we've got national pollinator monitoring which i think we need i think that it's clear that the, mm. we don't have enough evidence and haven't had enough evidence to date and landowners large-scale landowners are being encouraged to change their practices some of the things we've mentioned like creating habitats making sure they're creating habitats using wildflower mixes creating margins at the edge of the fields where where these uh, where our where, you know pollinators can feed and, and find habitat. So all of those things are happening, but it's, I think it's absolutely not enough if we're looking at the, the, if, you know, the no, is, signs is it, that we're seeing. Can you say yet whether the decline in the bee population is being reversed or slowed? I, th <clears throat> I think we, we, we don't have the science to tell us, and I think um, we're still heading in the wrong direction. We've got agriculture is very much still focused on yield everybody it's agricultural productivity it's a mantra that farmers been forced to accept for decades um mm. trying to get greater and greater productivity um and how do you do that you put more fertilizer more pesticides you're increasingly um investing chemicals mm. instead of instead of a more natural thing where you you, you um work with nature and that's why we're seeing a whole see, host of is, problems. Th this is know, the yeah. balance, isn't it? And yeah. it's a very difficult one because are, are you suggesting that we don't need as much food as we're trying to grow? Um, and if you're not saying that, how do we manage with, with less food, et cetera, et cetera? Oh, I'm saying you can. I'm not even sure you can yeah. give yes. me an answer to yes. that one. I think you, I, we know farm, we're working with a, a yeah. number of progressive farmers and they are producing, they are, they, they are just as productive, but they, they've got a different mindset. 
Okay, well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to Lutfi on that one in just a moment because you can tell us whether that works or not. But, but Manu, wh one more thing. The question was, are we facing an insect Armageddon? Do, do you believe we are? I think that we... Uh, uh, well, Armageddon <laughs> is a very strong word. I wouldn't go, <laughs> go that far. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think that we that potentially we are facing declines in a lot of insect species. The problem is that we don't we can't sort of tell for certain because of the lack of data. But through a process of inference, we know from the decades of scientific evidence what does affect insect populations. We know that pesticides kill off beneficial insects. We know that habitat clearing re causes reductions in invertebrate diversity in locations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if we know that those things can actually impact insect populations, I don't think we need yeah. to sort of sit around and wait until the data appears to do something about but you, it. Well, you see, the, what I'm hearing here is that everybody believes it's happening, but nobody has very much proof. Well, I think that's because we've had a bit of a an entomological deficit as well, that we haven't been training uh, enough uh, people to work on invertebrates. There's been this sort of focus, because we're mammals, we're vertebrates, that a lot of zoology and ecology has been based looking at uh, the, the minority organisms, which are the vertebrates. And, of course, most organ zoological organisms are invertebrate. And yet the study of entomology, when I was a... A student there were quite a lot of us <laughs> and we've been uh, not a lot compared with other things but we numbers have gone down and that's one of the reasons why I mean for example at Harper Adams we entomologists only, Armageddon yeah well there is there has been a, a real shortage of entomologists yeah. and decline that's we run the only postgraduate course in entomology in the country there's only one <laughs> How many students? Uh, we've got 22. OK, well, that's a start. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, yeah, I would say... Then, I think then I'll come to look yes. the, on, on the, yeah. the economics of... Mm -hmm. Trying to encourage. I think insects. the fact that Simon's an endangered species, if the, because we, you know, the attention has been focused on yields and high tech. Yeah. We've had that's been the approach. So the research hasn't gone into long scale field research into how we work with nature. It's all gone into, you know, the 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 the, 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 the you know the, the glossy the glossy stuff, which are often is associated with kind of selling products and but, but big will business, it now which is into it. Do you think? What, what we would hope so. We're beginning to wake up to a lot, a whole host mm -hmm. of problems that we've caused like losing our topsoil, losing carbon from our soils, uh, losing biodiversity, they're all associated and if people like Ludwig are actually working with nature, they're addressing all of those problems, but it's complex. We've had, a, we've reduced, we've had a very simplistic system where we've reduced problems and tried to tackle them, what, you know, uh, in isolation and you need, the, the land is a living organism and it needs to be, I think it needs to yeah. be treated like that. Okay, at the end of life as we know it, if, if we lose all of our insects, we're, we're, we're not at that point yet, but you're, you're trying to sort of encourage them to come back. So how would you encourage other people to do what you think is the right thing? Well, I think very much as you've just said, we, we can join the dots that this is not really just in the area of insects. We need to say this is soils, this yeah. is um, uh, insect life, it's, it's biodiversity, wildlife. All of these, uh, we're seeing issues, if not clear clear proof of, of a decline but we're seeing a lot of issues a lot of problems um, and we can certainly relate them back to land use changes we can relate them back to pesticides mm. so I think we sort of know where it's coming from and the solution has to be similarly holistic it has to take on board all of those changes and say how can we we tackle and, and change I'm going that. to give Simon the last word on this because he mentioned to me before we went on air that he's writing a book called aphids are fab they're, they're your favorite <laughs> they're insects favorite. So, so you've got maybe a minute to sell okay. us aphids which okay. eat our roses and all sorts okay. of other things so people think of aphids as bad things but there's only 250 aphid species that are pests the other 4750 are either rare endangered never seen and they're doing all sorts of in interesting things uh, you might think the honeydew that falls onto your car from underneath the sycamore tree isn't nice, but if, you, if it's coming from a lime tree, bees are collecting it, taking it back to their hive and making a special honey called lime, lime, lime flower honey, which sells it. And, and the aphids are involved in that? Oh, that's, yes, the uh, honeydew is produced by the aphids. <laughs> OK, and, and look, you've got badges on I've that say so you're a fellow of an aphid society, well, we're endangered species, species. <laughs> including one endangered British political <laughs> party. <laughs> um, do you think the fact that we're having this conversation is going to change things? Well, anything that gets people to take more interest in nature and to get their children out into nature and to stop mm. mowing their lawns and putting decking. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I, yeah, I've got to mow my lawn. No, you don't. 
you, you can wait until <laughs> yeah. certain plants, parts have flowered. You can leave yeah. borders, edges. Yeah. We're, we're getting a massive response yeah. on the farm, yeah. actually, from people who are aware of these issues. They want to be fed the, the, the news. They want to learn. They want to see where their food's coming from. They want to get involved in projects and activities. So th there's an economic issue. Um, one is that you've got to make the polluter pay. You've actually got to sort of change the, the playing field mm. so that we're not competing against cheap food that's artificially subsidized. The other is we do charge more, but we educate our customers. They get involved. They have that connection. So local food, local connections. I think that's all really important. We've got to sort of be invested morally in making the changes that we then want to And you've certainly see. done me a favour because it means tonight I'm not going to have to mow the lawn. <laughs> well, actually, we've got some lovely buttercups which yeah, have exactly. left, left at the side. We've got to go. We've got to go. Thank you all very much indeed. Manu, thank you very much uh, in Australia. So next time you're out uh, scratching your head because you've got too many gnats or whatever they happen to be, in it, next time you see a creepy crawly on the floor or a dung beetle and you say, ah, remember, without them there would not be us. You've been watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Thanks for watching. See you next time, I hope. Bye.